Good morning. In the name of God, I bid you welcome to this place and to this time of prayer. And to those of you who are joining us at home, welcome to Port Wallace Church in spirit as we join together in body. As we come together, we acknowledge that we come from a variety of different backgrounds and we bid all people welcome to this place. So, welcome. Or as the first people of this land would say, Jalasi. Try that. Jalasi. Now you know at least one word in Mi'kmaq. So welcome to this place. Bienvenue, welcome, welcome. Bienvenidos, falcha, gnachasha. Bienvenue à tous les gens qui nous joignent ce matin en français aussi, parce qu'il y a des petits ce matin qui parlent français. Bienvenue. So welcome to all of us as we gather together. We acknowledge that we're meeting in Mi'kmaq, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. As they bid us welcome, so we bid you welcome now to the kingdom of Christ. Let us join together in the call to worship. Let us rise up into God's presence. <coughs> God is calling us to a banquet, but the children of the world answer. I am too busy. I Creation is calling us to care for the ailing planet, but the children of the world answer. I am too busy. I Friends around us are calling out for a visit, but the children of the world answer. I am too busy. I so what should the church say to the children of the world? God of the universe, craving creation in caring arms, shouting into the oppressive silence of human society, and whispering words of wisdom to the wandering, infuse us with your spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thine right come, thine villagishem, be in himel to us. Dona no should we not a pants to show. A pardon no knows our fancy. Come no pardon no see a circuit is also fancy. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn is found in the coiled book, number 28. Number 28, God of the Bible. <laughs>
Please be seated. The prayer of compassion for our church community is found in the bulletin on page two. Let us pray together. God of infinite patience, infinite love, and infinite mercy, forgive what we do and neglect to do. Forgive what we say and neglect to say. Forgive what we confess and neglect to confess. In your patience, love, and mercy, reform us, refresh us, and revive us until we are born again in your image. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In silence, let us confess whatever is broken in our lives. Let us give that to God. Let us pray. Into your hands we commend ourselves. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Whatever burden we brought here this morning, there's somebody's fingers are already on the strings that tie that burden to us. And that person is Christ our Lord, setting us free from the webs in which we have caught ourselves, setting us free from the burdens we bear to this place, <coughs> setting us free from what was, and opening up the package that is us to the possibility of what can be. And now the Spirit seeks to move among us, to set us free, to open our eyes, to breathe new life into us. Therefore, I assure you that whatever sins there are in your world, God now seeks to set you free through the grace of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us slowly, quietly, gently sing our thanksgiving as published in the bulletin. Does God understand him? And I said, that's a good question, because I don't know if people know if God understands them. So what made you, oh, oh, because I talked to you in Gaelic. Ah, and you want to know if God understands if you talk Gaelic back to me. I think God does. Because you know, God started to speak Hebrew, and God spoke Greek, and God spoke Aramaic, and God spoke Latin, and God spoke a whole raft of different languages. And yes, God speaks English, and God speaks Gaelic. Et je crois que, que tu parles français, c'est bien que l'anglais. Oui, il n'y a pas de différence entre les langues, Seamus. Parce que Dieu comprend toutes les langues, même les langues qui sont à l'intérieur de nous autres. Yeah, even in our thoughts, God understands us. And the best of all, God knows us. And we can say anything to God in whatever language we want. And God understands us. And sometimes, when we say hurtful things, mm -hmm. yes, like you say and like I say too, God understands where that comes from, Seamus. No, God doesn't like it. God doesn't say it. But God understands when sometimes huma humans and bears and cats and rats and elephants say things that hurt. And God tries to bring healing first to us so we can understand where that comes from, but then to the people to whom it was said or the people who heard what was said. 
And then God brings healing to society when people start to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there have been some pretty hurtful things said in this past week. Mm -hmm. Things about Israel, things about Palestine. Mm -hmm. A lot of hatred, a lot of anger. No, no, God doesn't condone that. God doesn't say that's right. God challenges us to think what's going on. I don't know why humans paint the world in black and white. Paint one side right and one side wrong. I don't know, Seamus. But God sees the larger picture. God hears the words that aren't said. And God tries to speak God's word to the situation. Mm -hmm. They are all the children of Abraham. Arabs and Jews. Mm -hmm. Yes, God loves them. No, God doesn't love one more than another. But God's heart is broken. Yes. And God hears what's being said and what's not being said. What do we say? Well, we have to talk about it. We have to try to listen to what God would say to us. And we have to try to bring another voice, God's voice, into the conversation. Yes, economics have a voice. Yes, hatred has a voice. Yes, persecution has Yes, there's many, many voices. But we have to try to interject God's voice. Oh, so you want us all to pray for the children of Abraham on both sides. Maybe they will lay down in peace together in Jerusalem. That's what Isaiah hoped for. Okay, then you lead in prayers. Yes, yes, a bear. God can hear your language. Okay. Oh, you want me to speak it out loud? Okay, I'll read your thoughts. Okay, let's say it together. In peace, dear God, I come to you through Jesus Christ who makes me new. And while I run or play or rest, be with those whom I love best. Guide me in your holy way as you walk with me each day. Amen. There, see? God heard a bear speak this morning. Well done. Well done. And now God's going to hear a choir sing. Okay, let's listen. See what, God, see what the choir is going to say to us from God.
and come and lead us in the lessons. For those of you who have children, we have um, children's packages available. I don't have got them. Bulletins about the first lesson this morning, about the golden calf. If you haven't got one, Judy, wherever she's hiding, she, there, okay, she'll give you one. So raise your hand if you haven't got a package already. Matt. <coughs> Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Exodus, reading in chapter 32, verses 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fas fashioning it from, with a tool. Then he said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw all this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings, presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. The Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people? who you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he has threatened. Our responsive lesson comes from Isaiah 25. I will praise your name. You have done the wonderful things that you have promised to do in perfect faithfulness and keep your promises. Therefore, strong peoples will honor you. Cities of ruthless nations will tremble and revere you. for the poor, a refuge from the needy in their distress, a shelter in the storms of life, and a shade in the heat of worry, you silence the uproar of our enemies. prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, the best of meats and the finest of wines, 
In the sanctuary of the Almighty, God will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. The Almighty will rip the sheet that covers all nations. The veil that separates God from humanity. God will swallow up death forever. The Lord, the ruler of the universe, will wipe every tear from our eyes. God will remove his people's shame from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from Philippians chapter 4 verses 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Eodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. Please stand if you're able. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet." But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go, greet the street cor- so go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. The king, then the king told the attendants, tie him a hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. May God bless this reading of his holy word. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
How many of you have been to camp when your kids growing up? How many of you know this song? I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excused. I cannot come. No, you don't know that one? Oh, well. But I was raised on dreams and stories, as the Irish people say. Raised on dreams and stories and heroes of renown. The passing tales and glory of what was my hometown. And a great storyteller always relives these and tries to inspire them in the back in the minds of the people. Um, I was also raised in one, maybe you guys know it in the back. Fair do do calamoti frere, feto do turala do lo lo. Tilkane? Wait, see? Just some of those songs are just in you, just know them. And a good storyteller always tries to bring them back to people and carry them back, not from where they are, but carry them back in their memory to times that were other times. Carry them back to a place where there was happiness. Carry them back to a struggle. He tries to take what was yesterday and bring it to the present. So I was raised in dreams and stories. And a good storyteller always embellishes and adds to the story and always tries to make it relevant to the audience that he or she has at hand and always puts their own particular twist on it. Throughout the ages, we take the gospel and do the same thing to it. We retell it. We make it relevant to the present moment, the present situation, and to the present generation. We don't leave it locked in history. We take and read it there and bring it to the present moment so that it becomes alive to people. Throughout the ages, we always do this. And Matthew takes the parable this morning of the wedding feast that Jesus originally told, and he embellishes it. He adds to it. He makes it relevant to the people he's dealing with. And he puts his own particular and peculiar twist on it. He takes the parable of Jesus. There was a common story in the Christian community. A story of invitation to a wedding feast. A story of rejection of that invitation. And then a story of inclusion of others to come to the banquet. Matthew takes a story, embellishes it, makes it relevant to his time, and puts it, his own twist on it. How would you rewrite the story of the wedding feast. Because you know it as a child, I cannot come, I cannot come to the banquet. How do you tell that in today's language? Let's take a look at how it was reworked and how we would rework it. Matthew was a Jewish Christian, writing to Jewish Christians, living in the area of Jerusalem. And since the time of Jesus, they had been persecuted by their fellow Jews as being an heretical sect of Judaism because they welcomed and included Samaritans. They welcomed and included Greeks. They even were welcoming some of the Romans into their midst, the op oppressors. They were giving women a role. Too bad we didn't keep on with it. They were giving children a chance to speak. Blessed are they. They were a wonderful, inclusive, evolving community, but they're seen as being heretical by their fellow Jews. They have been treated with suspicion. They were being ostracized from their synagogues. Oh, you're one of them. Ever heard that said to you? Because of their rejection of the strict and often literal Jewish interpretation of the Torah laws and commandments, especially those around dietary laws, around Sabbath laws, and around the laws concerning circumcision. The civil powers, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, who were trying to keep peace between the Jews and the occupying forces, often blamed the Christians as an escape for the present problems that were at hand and for civil unrest. All these factors led to developing tensions between Matthew's Jewish community and the Jewish communities that were around them, and between the population that was general around them. Those who were not religious looked upon them as being um, disturbers, I'll let you put in the first word, okay? <laughs> they looked at the people as these were the source of our problems, and they inflicted great pain on the community. Matthew's gospel was written after the destruction of the temple, and the people blamed the destruction of the temple on the Christians. So the parable of the wedding feast takes on a different twist in Matthew's gospel. It reflects his time, it reflects his location, it reflects his own personal twist on the story of Jesus. And as we read it, we read of his anger. 
We read of his frustration, and we read of his community's reaction to oppression. Sometimes retelling the gospel, the, in the retelling of the gospel, the loving words of Christ are eclipsed by human hatred. Christ's inclusive voice is silenced by our human violent voice. And Christ's invitation to come to the banquet is vetted by our human prejudice. You cannot come to this banquet because you have to be one of us. I think that is why Matthew's retelling of the wedding feast is kept in the gospel, so that we can see how retelling of the gospel come at sometimes can become something that's not Christ-like, and sometimes the gospel message is left out. It's always easy for us to have a very easy conversation with people, especially if they're tied to trivi trivial matters. How's the weather? Who cares? It's going to change in Nova Scotia. What did you do for Thanksgiving? Who cares? It's past. Are you planning a vacation? I hope you're not. I guys get jealous. <laughs> How's your family? I don't really care, but I've got to ask the question. Okay? What did you think of the game last night? I hope your team lost. <laughs> okay? But when matier matters arise, we're often tongue-tied. We often grow silent or try to change the conversation. What do you think about the murders in Gaza, in Israel? Is there a gradation of evil? Is one side more evil than the other? We don't want to talk about that. We're fearful of how others will judge us. We're fearful of how our friends might see us. And we're fearful that our anger might pour out. The easy conversations with their drab predictable responses, how are you today, good, dear, good, are seen for what they are in the gospel, drab platitudes, dull stories, and dead ends. When we move beyond the mundane, the conversation sometimes can turn adversarial, confrontational, tense, and testy. Matthew could have simply included the story about the wedding feast and left it as that, dull, drab, and dead. But the gospel always addresses the pain that is present in our community and always addresses the problems that communities are facing. The gospel never leaves us in the mediocre muddle of the middle. It gives voice to pain. And this is what Matthew does in his story, his take, his twist, on the wedding feast. He takes the story of redemption, inclusion, and salvation, which was and is the basic story of the wedding feast, the basic story of Jesus, and he brings it alive to his audience, his present audience, and he writes his people into that, and he allows their pain to come out in that story. He embellishes it, he adds to it, he makes it relevant to the audience at hand, and he puts his own particular and peculiar twist upon it. He speaks to the pain that his congregation is feeling. An uncertain and an unnamed feast suddenly becomes a wedding feast. An uncertain and unnamed setting suddenly becomes the, the banquet of the kingdom of heaven. An uncertain and unnamed man suddenly becomes the king. And the uncertain and unnamed people suddenly become Matthew's congregation. The story is embellished to make the gospel relevant to the people at hand. Matthew's Christian community was defeated. It was deflated. It was discouraged. It was disenfranchised. The fellow Jews had turned against them, the ones they thought would be supporting of them and caring about them. The Jewish leaders were persecuting them. And they asked the question, where is God in the midst of this hell? Where is God in the midst of the hell of Gaza? Where is God in the midst of the hell of Israel? Where is God in the midst of hell? Do you remember the old creed, how it used to word, read? And he descended into hell. Where is God? God is in Gaza this morning. Where is hell? Hell was at the festival. Where is hell? Hell is someplace in our midst. 
Where is God? God is in hell. Matthew's Christian community was in hell. So when Matthew retells the story, the parable made them feel that God knew of their anguish, that God was with them. For Matthew's com community, the retelling of the story gave them hope. God was there with them. Matthew used the word worthy in the gospel, that they were worthy of God's love. It was a word that made them feel that they suddenly mattered, that somebody in the midst of nobody caring for them heard their voice. They became God's invited guests to God's banquet. It was a word that held out for them the dream of heaven as they were living through the present of hell. Fanny Crosby wrote the hymn Blessed Assurance as a way of retelling that even in her blindness she felt worthy of God's love. For in her blindness people looked upon her. You're a freak. You're a mistake. You are beyond the scope of God's love. There's something wrong with you. Your parents did something wrong, that you are blind. And yet she was assured that God still loved her, even as people around her rejected her. For her, the self-righteous people who rejected the original invitation to the banquet feast were still present and around in her world. Don't Laugh at Me is a song written by Alan Shamblin and Steve Seskin and recorded by Mark Willis. I'll quote it to you. I'm the little boy with glasses, the one they call the geek, a little girl who never smiles because I've got braces on my teeth. I know how it feels to cry myself to sleep. I'm the little boy who cuts himself to let out deep pain. I'm the kid on every playground who's always chosen last. I'm a single teenage mother trying to overcome my past. You don't have to be my friend, but is it too much to ask? Don't laugh at me. Don't call me names. Don't get your pleasure from my pain. In God's eyes, we're all the same. Someday we'll all have perfect wings. Don't laugh at me. I'm the cripple on the corner. You've passed by on the street. And I wouldn't be out here begging if I had enough to eat. And don't think I don't notice that our eyes never meet. I lost my wife and little boy when someone crossed that yellow line. The day we laid them in the ground is the day I lost my mind. And right now, I'm down to holding this little cardboard sign. Don't laugh at me. Don't call my name. Don't get your pleasure from my pain. For in God's eyes, we're all the same. Someday, we'll all have perfect wings. Don't laugh at me. I'm fat. I'm thin. I'm short. I'm tall. I'm deaf. I'm blind. But aren't we all? Don't laugh at me. How does God speak in those situations? In Matthew's retelling of the parable, God is present. God is present in the form of the king and sends out an invitation first to the family that he loves, first to his own family, those who were bidden. It's a lovely word. In Hebrew, it means the ones you were obliged to. It's a Hebrew expression. A wonderful expression. If you've ever been preparing for a wedding, you know what they're talking about. The ones you're obliged to invite. There are the obligatory invitations. Dear old Aunt Bertha and Uncle Joe and their strange son, Cousin Ernie. And then there are the three witches from Shakespeare's Macbeth, otherwise known as the Weird Sisters. And all of our families have them. And then there's the rich ones, the connected ones, the business partners, the unpartnered, the repartnered, the not too certain who they're partnered, all of whom are bidden to come. In Matthew's Gospel, the bidden were their fellow Jews, the children of Abraham and Sarah, the blood of their blood, the ones whom God invites out of obligation. Why? Because God made a covenant with their ancestors that he would be their God and they would be his people. And God never turns his back on a covenant. The obligatory ones are invited. Not just once, but twice. God never gives up, you see. 
And the invitation gets even better. Tell them I've already slaughtered the best. I've got the food prepared. The banquet is wonderful. Come, come. Everything is ready. Come to the banquet. Matthew sees the wedding banquet as a foretaste of heaven, a present incarnation of the messianic banquet that will come at the end of time and the one which is celebrated here and now in the present in expectation of a feast that is yet before us. For Matthew, those who invite, uh, rejected the invitation also rejected the inclusivity of Christ, rejected the openness of Christ's love, which calls us to embrace all people, which rejected the celebratory joy that Christ tries to bring to religion. Those who rejected the wedding invitation were seen as those who rejected Christ which at the time were not only their fellow Jews, but the Jewish leaders who had excuses. I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Please hold me excused. I cannot come. Sound valid excuses, no? Not, not so? They cannot come, but they make light of the invitation as well. Matthew describes them not as the majority, but as a vocal and a powerful minority. And as we look at the situations around the world today, those who say they can not come, who reject inclusivity, are not the majority, but they're a vocal and loud minority. Matthew here is taking a very uncharitable view of his fellow Jews, and it was mutual. His fellow Jews had an uncharitable view of him. And in these words, we don't find the love of Christ. We read Matthew's own particular take on the story. The core of the story is that if the bidden will not come, then God will invite others. So the invitation is issued. Go to the highways, go to the byways, invite to the marriage feast as many as you can find. And they are gathered, all of whom they found them, they brought them. And Matthew adds the words, the good and the bad. I love that final phrase. There's no need to include it, but you've got to remember at the wedding feast of God, there are the good and the bad. You see, the invitation didn't depend on your past life, good or bad. You're not judged on whether you're outstanding or out to lunch. And you're not invited because of your social position or your unsocial reputation. You were invited to come to the banquet because you were made in God's image, and you are God's children. Israeli, Palestinian, Jew, Muslim, Christian, you are made in God's image, and God invites you to come to a banquet, to sit down with each other, to talk things through. These lines are Christ's and demonstrate the inclusivity of the gospel. It would have been good if the story ends there, but it doesn't in Matthew. We must read, always read the gospel in the context of its time in which they were composed, in the context of the author and the community to whom he was writing, and in context of the particular happenings in the world at that time. Even within Matthew's community, there were people who were only half in, some people who were Christian because it was advantageous. Some people wanted to remain with Jews, but with a twist. Some wanted to keep all the Jewish laws and demanded that if a Gentile come to the community, they must become Jews before they can become Christians. And there were followers in the community who only saw it as a way of enforcing their will on other, the zealots, who saw Jesus as a revolutionary who would eventually overthrow the Romans. The vast majority, with varying opinions and comprehensions of Jesus, just as you here have various understandings and comprehensions of Jesus, understood him as the fulfillment of the prophets and their spiritual message that, they, that God gave through them to the people. And they tried desperately to imitate him as they knew him in their daily lives. Matthew recognizes this and includes the words, the good and the bad are present in the community, as well as the additional lines that when a king enters, he sees a person who is not wearing the wedding garments someone who slipped in, someone who was not there for the wedding feast, but for what he or she could get. Friend, did you not get, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? The person is speechless, and the king says, kick him out. 
The Gospel of Matthew was written after the destruction of the temple. The Jewish Christians saw the destruction as God's punishment on their fellow Jews, who did not accept the invitation of Christ. The Jews blamed the destruction on heretical groups within Judaism, such as the Christians, and expelled them from Judaism. There was a period of mutual hatred in which Matthew's Gospel is written. Hatred that had nothing to do with Judaism or Christianity, but with human pride, human prejudice, and human pain. Today we write a story in the Middle East of human pride, human prejudice, and human pain. We must understand the context. It didn't just happen. In today's world, it's so easy to pick up on similar veins of hatred, to blame people for our problems, the housing shortage is caused by immigrants. They're taking away our jobs. My home village will fall flat in its face if all the Mexicans went home. They keep the fish plants going. And Tim Hortons, all across the country, nobody will get their double-double if the immigrants went home. In a world, in this world, there is a spirit that defies the evolution of human society that plants seeds of hatred, seeds of suspicion, seeds of dissension. Just call an election, and you will hear that under the thin veneer of civility runs a very deep undercurrent of hatred. But in this world also, there is the Spirit of God who tries to open our eyes, who invites others to come to this banquet, and who tries to form a community where there is room for all. In our present context, both as a Christian community and as a country, the Holy Spirit is trying to give new birth to a new reality. The old ones who refuse to change, who reject the inclusivity of the gospel, and who only want the old time religion and a country that no longer exists, have to wake up to the fact that the temple is gone. We have to evolve a new form of life. And that was Matthew's community. Yet for Matthew's community and all the struggles, out of them grew a wonderful faith in Christ that renovated the old time religion that eventually included the Gentiles who did not have to convert to Judaism and that went first to talk to their own people and then went to talk to the strangers in their midst and thereby learned how to spread the good news of Christ's inclusivity to those around them. From this community, we are descended, people who were brave enough to overcome the voices of the world and listen to God, brave enough to embellish the story that they were hearing and make it their own, brave enough to make it relevant to their day and time, and brave enough to put their own particular twist on it in this context. But at all times, they kept the core message of the gospel. Christ's kingdom includes all. So go and tell the love of God. Put your twist upon it. Add your story. Embellish that story. Make it wonderful. Keep Christ at the center. And you will tell the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen. We have something coming up, I know we do. The offertory hymn. <laughs> it's included in your bulletin. This once again is a new hymn. Adam, do you want to try to introduce it to the people? Yes, we will sing it once through first, and then feel free to join in with us for the second and third time. Okay, so the second and third times. Got it? Once, two, three.
I don't know if I give them 100% on that one or not, but we're working on it. Anything new takes time to learn. We will learn. Beloved of God, as we come to God in prayer this morning, let us open our lives. Let us hear the polarization that is going on in the news. And let us listen for God's voice, which is neither pole, but somewhere in the middle. The old saying is, if you put two Jews in a room, you have three opinions. Let us listen for the third opinion in the middle. Let us always realize life is not this or that. Life is in the middle. Let us listen for God. Let us give, allow people to have voice on both sides. But let us listen for God. Let us pray. Great and mysterious God, you've formed this universe. You called it into being. You fashioned it with your fingers. You have made it with the imprint of your fingerprint in every place. Open our eyes to see the wonder of your world. For wonder is the beginning of wisdom, of understanding, of hearing your conversation. Therefore, give us hearts that seek to wonder. We ask your blessing this day on all your children. On the children of Abraham, be they Arab or Jew. On the children of your covenant, which includes us, the Gentiles. On the children who are yet to be born, we ask your blessing. And upon those who are born into a new understanding, help us to hear their voice and seek their wisdom. Eternal God, who rejects none, who loves all, and yet, yet who chastises us, gently chastise us this day, and grant that wise men and women may appear not only in the biblical text of Christmas in Jerusalem of long ago, but wise men and women may appear in all world capitals to offer guidance in this time. Eternal God, give your church the voice she needs to speak, to challenge, to love, to forgive, to heal, to guide, to speak peace. Give us the courage to challenge and to love. Eternal God, watch over our children. Help them to grow up in a new world, a brave world, a loving world. Watch over the child within each one of us, that that child should be free to speak his or her voice. Watch over the child that is in an old person who's being born into a new world and may the peace they find give us peace. Be near, we pray to you this day, those who are in strange places, not only in refugee camps scattered around the world, but in nursing homes, in hospitals, in places of care. Be near to your children in strange places. Be near to your children who are behind bars, bars of steel in jail in a prison, but bars of public opinion in an equally strong and hateful prison. Be near to your children who are imprisoned. Be near to your children who have a dream. And may that dream give birth to new hope, not only within themselves, but in the people around them, in our society and in our world. Loving God, hold us now. Remake us, remold us, refurbish us for your glory and help us to be vessels that carry your light into this world. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 271 in Voices United. There's a wideness in God's mercy. <laughs>
now off into your world. Go wherever Christ calls you to go today. Look for the footprints, the fingerprints of God in the world around you and be amazed at the beauty that God has given to this world. Open your eyes to wonder and to beauty. In the name of Christ, see Christ's creation. And go from this place with God's blessing. Let us pray. Gracie, be malariv, von ahers, von marcus, von spirit nuv, and tungia, bio is fear, and hio is a mach, is kushiri bra. Eke la benediction puissant, de Dieu le Père, le Fils, le Saint-Esprit, soit toujours avec vous, et vos autres, d'ici jusqu'à l'éternité. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us, to be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. And may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us forevermore. Amen. Seated. For those of you at home, the announcements for the church community will fold up on your screen, following one to the other. Uh, Kathy's at home, running the service at home. We're not going to run through everything there. Kathy, just gently fold down through it, and we'll give people an oversight of them. You see, this afternoon, this, or this morning, there's a session meeting at 11:30. Uh, the stewards meeting this evening. Discussion group on Tuesday evening. Wednesday, Bible study in person. I think Wednesday's going to be choir practice this week. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, Wednesday choir practice at 7.30. Yep. It's 7.30 this week, choir practice. And you see there, Saturday, choir practice, Dave Carroll in concert, and next Sunday, the early morning worship service in person, and worship at 10 o'clock. Also, at the early morning service, we're doing a teaching time, which is geared towards children as well as, well as adults, explaining the service. So it's going to be sort of like a um, quasi-Sunday school. What you have in your hands for children this morning, that's what we talked about this morning at the 9 o'clock service. So it's a time for parents. If you haven't come to the 9 o'clock, you can pick up the information sheet and go from there. These are roughly your announcements. Are there further announcements for the community? Anything at home, Kathy? Nothing from here, There's Ivan. Nothing, nothing from here. Then let us go to love and serve God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.